Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Drug Talk. As always, I'm your host, Garrett Campbell. Today we're going to be talking about a medication known as hydromorphone. Its brand name is Dilaudid. Now before we talk about the medication itself, just keep in mind that this channel is for information purposes only and not to be used as a source for recommendations for your personal health care. So hydromorphone is a pure opioid agonist and it primarily acts as an analgesic agent. Though the exact mechanism of action is not fully understood, it's thought that hydromorphone may exert its effects by binding to mu opioid subtype receptors. In terms of indications for use, it can be used to treat moderate to severe pain in opioid tolerant patients, and it can also be used to treat severe pain in patients who are opioid tolerant who require long-term treatment with around-the-clock opioid analgesia. Now, before somebody was to use hydromorphone or dilaudid, there's a few contraindications they must clear, as well as some precautions and warnings that they should be made aware of. This medication should not be given to individuals who have acute or severe bronchial asthma in an unmonitored setting. It would be contraindicated in patients who have a hypersensitivity to hydromorphone or any other compound of the product. It's contraindicated in patients who have a known or suspected gastrointestinal obstruction. It's also contraindicated in patients who are not opioid tolerant as there's an increased risk of fatal respiratory depression. It should not be used in patients who have an increased risk of gastrointestinal narrowing or obstruction. This can be due to underlying diseases or procedures that the patient may have had. And finally, it's contraindicated in patients who have significant respiratory depression. In terms of precautions, hydromorphone is on the Beers criteria, which is a list of medications that the elderly population should either avoid or use cautiously. In this population, they would be at an increased risk of falls, therefore fractures, because of the cognitive impairment that this medication can cause. Severe hypotension and orthostatic hypotension have been reported with the use of hydromorphone. Patients with a compromised ability to control their blood pressure would be at more of a risk of developing this hypotension. It should be noted that opioids can cause adrenal insufficiency due to inadequate amounts of cortisol. Dosage adjustments may be required in patients who have Addison's disease or hypothyroidism. Reduced initial doses of the oral liquid as well as the immediate release tablets may be required in patients who have gallbladder disease. Use of hydromorphone may exacerbate symptoms in patients who have biliary tract disease as well as pancreatitis. Extended release versions of hydromorphone are not recommended to be used in patients who have severe hepatic impairment. Patients with a sulfite allergy may experience a life-threatening reaction to the injection formulation. Crushing, chewing, snorting, dissolving, or injecting extended release versions of hydromorphone may result in overdose, which could be fatal. There's a potential for life-threatening serotonin syndrome to occur while using hydromorphone. This would be more likely to occur in patients who are using other medications that affect serotonin levels. Seizure disorders may be induced or aggravated. You should avoid use of hydromorphone in patients with impaired consciousness. And finally, patients should be made aware that severe withdrawal symptoms may occur upon abrupt discontinuation. Now, once somebody is cleared of the contraindication and made aware of the precautions and warnings and they start using hydromorphone, there's a couple different ways they can receive their dose. It's available in tablet form. Some patients get it intramuscularly or subcutaneously, and it can also be given intravenously. I will go over example doses for these three dosage forms. However, the main takeaway with this medication would be that the patient and the physician must work together to find out the proper dose that works to control their pain. With the oral tablet, a common dose would be two or four milligrams every four to six hours as required for pain. And then this dose could be slowly increased until the pain is under control. One or two milligrams can be given intramuscularly or subcutaneously every two to three hours in these patients that do require that around-the-clock control with hydromorphone. The dose in this situation could actually be decreased if the patient was opioid naive. And finally, 0.2 to 1 milligram can be given intravenously over at least two to three minutes, and this can be done every two to three hours. So as with all medications, there are some side effects or adverse reactions that patients may experience while using hydromorphone. So I'll list off some of those here for you now. Flushing may happen less than 2% of the time with the extended release version. And itchiness can happen 1% to 8% of the time. Constipation develops between 7 and 31% of the time. 
and 9 to 28 percent of patients develop nausea. Vomiting may happen in 14 percent of patients. Dizziness and headache can happen up to 11 and 12 percent respectively and somnolence would happen in 2 percent of patients. Now some more rare but serious side effects would be adrenal insufficiency, the development of a seizure, a patient experiencing a coma, respiratory depression or respiratory arrest, suicidal thoughts, and drug withdrawal. That's all we're going to talk about today with hydromorphone or Dilaudid. As always, I'm thankful you took the time to combine and watch one of my videos. If you found the information valuable and you'd like to help me grow this channel, you can like the videos, share the videos, and most importantly, subscribe to the YouTube channel. There's also some links in the description you can check out as well. That's it for today. Take care.